free to give long introductions. So you can gather your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Sorry, is it six to seven? Because it doesn't say on the program. What time does it finish? Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for um, joining us on a wet and strangely cold <laughs> evening here in Perugia. Um, some of the people on this panel who I'll introduce you to in a moment, I lured here with the promise of gelato and piazzas in the sunshine <laughs> and all manner of other Italian delights. They will come, um, I'm told, tomorrow possibly by the Italians in the audience who may or may not have been sponsored by the local weather bureau. Um, <laughs> but we're here for something a, a bit more sober than a conversation about the weather. We're here for a conversation about how it might be possible to continue to do investigative journalism that is dependent upon whistleblowers and confidential sources to do the work that needs to be done to reveal what others would prefer to be hidden in the public interest. I mean, this is a grand mission. Um, and journalists are sometimes decried for um, presenting their mission as being so closely tied to speaking truth to power and revealing what uh, many people would prefer to be hidden. But this is essential, essentially our work. And there's a lot of conversation um, internationally currently about whether or not journalists can continue to do such high impact work, um, not just because of the threats of mass surveillance and data retention and um, all sorts of digital interventions and the incivility that we now find online that's leading to attempts to regulate the internet, uh, to force um, real naming provisions on internet users, for example. So we have a lot of issues to confront um, if we are to be able to maintain our capacity to do high impact journalism. And this panel is going to examine one of the attempts we've made as an international journalism community to try to ensure that that can continue to happen, uh, particularly in the context of um, state capture that we're seeing internationally around the world, in the context of various attempts to shut down critical journalism from the Philippines uh, through to Latin America, um, certainly in uh, parts of uh, Western Europe, through Australasia, it's happening everywhere. So my name's Julie Pizzetti. Um, I'm a, a journalist, nearly 30 years worth of experience now, um, across broadcast and um, digital. And I'm an academic, and I'm currently uh, working at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. Um, and this time last year, um, I joined with a group of um, international um, experts from the profession some academics and some people working for press freedom organisations um, and other agencies um, trying to ensure that journalists have capacity to do their work. And the, the 20 odd of us gathered in one of the smaller hotels here and spent um, a couple of hours with wine <laughs> um, and, uh, and some Italian delights and talked um, about these very serious issues with um, James Ryson and um, as sort of inspiration uh, in, in the midst. And what we did after that was produce um, this handbook, which you've got access to. If people want them, they can come up at the end and take um, free copies. It's freely available online. It's called The Perugia Principles for Journalists Working with Whistleblowers in the Digital Age. Perugia principles because of um, its origins and what was a very uh, collaborative process um, and this conference is all about collaboration um, and sharing ideas and a celebration of journalism in times of um, deep distress uh, for many of us but also during times of massive positivity around the capacity to do investigative journalism because of the digital era. So we have examples um, here with Jared from the, Jared Rao from the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists, um, who was responsible for the support that brought the Panama Papers to life as a collaborative journalism project. And um, Frederick Obermeyer to my right, who was one of the, the international, uh, one of the journalists who initially received the biggest dump, I think we can still say, in investigative journalism history of data um, 
John Doe, as he insisted on, on being called, and um, this is a person who was determined to rely on encrypted communication in order to protect his anonymity. Um, Julia Angwin, who's doing um, f sort of forensic data journalism um, in new and fabulous and fascinating ways, um, having started um, the new organisation, The Markup, um, as a start-up after years with uh, ProPublica. And Sulet Dreyfus, Dr. Sulet Dreyfus, who is uh, the co-author of this, um, this handbook and also commissioned it uh, from Blueprint for Free Speech, which is a, an NGO working internationally to support the rights of whistleblowers. Um, and I'm going to take you through some of these principles in a moment. Um, there are um, 12, aren't there? <laughs> She says, having had a head in other research for the last 12 hours, 12 essential principles that we drilled down from an original 21. Um, Sulet, I might start with you. Um, if you can tell me why you decided to commission this project, um, particularly with a focus on whistleblower rights. Um, good evening, everyone. So I was originally a newspaper journalist, and I was a staff journalist on the largest selling newspaper in Australia, The Herald Sun. Um, part of News Limited. Uh, and I then went into uh, academia and I wear two hats, both at the University of Melbourne in the School of Computing and Information Systems and also running this small NGO blueprint for free speech, which is in support of the media and also in support of whistleblowings and re really um, the emerging human right of, uh, of whistleblowers, which we see as the right of being able to dissent from wrongdoing, to dissent from wrongdoing. Um, the Perugia Principles came about in part because I started hearing stories of uh, journalists who were uh, treating their whistleblowers with disrespect. And not just with disrespect, in one case a story came to me of a journalist who said, I don't really care if my whistleblower gets caught, uh, he's doing something wrong, it's illegal, he belongs in prison anyway. It was quite shocking. Um, having worked in investigative journalism, I was kind of appalled. But the kind of factors that seem to be emerging from these stories uh, is with the economic model of journalism uh, having the bottom falling out of it, a lot of journalists felt as though they didn't know if they'd be in the same job in 12 months' time, so it didn't matter if they burned their sources. Uh, also, with a lot of young journalists who come up through citizen journalism uh, or other places, they didn't have the kind of training that journalists traditionally had in large media organizations. When I worked at News Limited, one day a week for a whole year, we had training on media ethics, on shorthand, on all sorts of things. That's not available to a lot of journalists today. And so there seemed to be an emerging problem with the ethics of how you deal with sensitive sources, and particularly whistleblowers. The second element is the emergence of big data, machine learning, AI, and data analytics. And these are areas I have some familiarity with at University of Melbourne. Uh, and it became much easier to actually track people in a way that didn't before. Um, <clears throat> the last thing that inspired me is one of the uh, recommendations in the Perugia Principles was around making data sets public. And 20 years ago, I wrote a book with Julian Assange, who in many ways helped to invent that model of making data sets public journalism. Uh, and that's been an inspiration. It's obviously had a lot of hiccups along the way as well. It has not a lot of problems. At the same time as this has happened, I work with experts in computer science at the university who've been involved in re-identification of data, noticeably, um, out, notably out of uh, health data sets released by the Australian government, where supposedly the information was de-identified, yet a team of people were able to reconstruct um, seven celebrity Australians from the information provided in these data sets. Um, there are other examples. There's been research um, by de Montjoy uh, that found with four spatio-temporal points out of a data set of 1.5 million people, they were able to identify 95% of unique individuals. So this says that an anonymity is not what it once was. And that changes, in a sense, the moral obligations and the dynamics involved in what a journalist has in their responsibility to the whistleblower. So that's really where this came from. OK. And Sulet engaged me partly because I'd spent um, several years studying um, international frameworks to support the produ production of journalism, the practice of journalism in a digital context um, with confidential sources, which is a, a book called Protecting 
uh, journalism sources in the digital age for UNESCO. So that's the background that we brought to this project. And we, as I said, tried to make it a very collaborative crowdsourcing um, exercise on the basis of expertise being gathered. Um, so let's just, you've got the, the documents there, but I'll run through quickly um, the <coughs> 11 principles. So the first is defend your sources and protect anonymity, which as Sulet has, has described and others will attest to, um, has become more difficult, certainly. Um, provide safer ways for sources to make first contact. I mean, one of the things that we found in our research and practice is that whistleblowers and confidential sources will frequently inadvertently expose themselves by using unsafe methods of first contact with journalists. So using a work email is the most basic example to reach out to a journalist. Others will try and cover their tracks. Maybe they use a semi-secure um, um, app, for example. They might not be thinking about the fact that when they're um, you know, taking photographs of um, material on their computer screen, thinking that they can sneakily supply it to a journalist, they're actually being observed with um, you know, cameras, surveillance cameras in their office and so on. So there's lots to think about. Recognising the costs of whistleblowing. Whistleblowing is extremely emotionally, psychologically and often financially devastating for the people involved. And I think often as journalists we move so quickly um, to get stories into the public arena and the appetite for those stories diminishes pretty quickly. Often we don't have either capacity or will to stick with the people who have been the, 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 the sources who have, have revealed information. Not all of them, of course, are pure of heart, um, but many of them um, have taken enormous risks to, to reveal what it is that they have approached you with. Um, and to help sources think through what happens uh, when the story breaks and to deal with some of those impacts. Focus on the public interest value of the information rather than the attitudes or opinions of your source, which does not mean that you disregard motivation entirely. You obviously have to consider the potential for malicious intent and what the implications of that might be. Um, and increasingly, you need to think about um, in the disinformation crisis whether or not um, in the mix of the data that's been given to you is um, you know, a set of red herrings designed to perhaps misdirect or, or confuse or entrap journalists into releasing information that is uh, polluted. Take responsibility for your own digital defense and use encryption, even at the most basic level. I would say that means um, having Signal installed on your, in the current context, Signal installed on your mobile as an encrypted app. Um, and doing the best that you can to, um, to secure your communications when you're in uh, contact with a source who is potentially at risk or where the information is sensitive. Um, and, in, and just insist upon, in the context of professional journalism, better and more secure um, systems within your workplace. Determine what the biggest threats to you and your sources are and take steps to protect both of you. Um, so the, the idea of a threat hierarchy, not every story you work on is going to be the Panama Papers um, or um, any number of other um, investigative um, stories right back to um, Watergate and um, various um, international scandals um, which you can you know, um, discuss in terms of local examples. So what is the threat level if you're working on a story about um, the fashion industry, or the, you're, the, you're the couture correspondent for a French newspaper, do you have to be worried about this stuff, about digital defense and source protection? Well, I would argue that you have to have a very basic understanding and at least practice um, essential acts of digital hygiene. Because what if your contacts lead you to a story that involves organized crime in connection with the fashion industry, which suddenly places you in the midst of a much different story to one about fashion shows? Explain the risks of digital exposure to your source and train whistleblowers in basic digital security. These are m more controversial, but certainly were born out in the research that I did that was published in 2015 that I mentioned earlier, that we have a new ethical obligation, I would argue, to consider um, our responsibility if we promise to protect our sources, if we promise to defend their anonymity, what does that actually mean if the risks to them are greater and how do we enact our responsibility to them? Publish original documents and data sets where it's possible and safe to do so. A caveat there, so let talk to that. Securely delete the data that's been provided, consistent with your obligations. Not so quick, sorry. <laughs> this is online and you've got free access to it and there's copies up here. Uh, 
ensure that digital drop boxes offer a good level of security and anonymity. There's been quite the trend to have a digital drop box on, on every um, website, but you know, sometimes wonder whether anybody looks at it <laughs> and what capacity and skills they have if they, if they do um, at various news organisations. And finally, understand the legal, um, or, or penultimately, understand the legal and regulatory frameworks for protecting sources and whistleblowers. They differ internationally, but there are many international laws, um, particularly within the human rights framework, that can be very valuable um, to people even working at the local level to draw on and to use to educate your communities. And 12, encourage news publishers to provide proper data security and training for journalists. And one of the things that I've found as somebody working both as a journalist and someone responsible for the development of journalists in a large news organisation is that, as many of you will know, training is not necessarily the top agenda item in the context of an industry under great stress but never has there been a more important time to provide additional support for journalists' learning, and particularly in this um, area where risk is significant. So I'm going to stop talking now and actually come to the, the, the currently active and, and very um, high-impact journalists on our panel. And I want to start with you, Frederick. Um, can you tell me, um, as somebody who um, was consulted about this, um, this project, but who is more importantly, working in this space, um, what you think about these principles and perhaps where there might be gaps um, that need to, be, need to be filled? First of all, I think it's very good to have those principles in writing because I think a lot of those uh, principles are part of our daily practice, especially in invas investigative journalism, but it's important to put it in writing, not only to present it to your editors, because some of those principles mean essentially costs. Setting up a secure drop system, for example, costs you at least, I would say, three or four thousand um, euros. To keep it running means keep journalists trained. And if you explain it to an editor um, that you have to spend three or four thousand euros for something where you don't know what comes out of it, because let's face the facts, secure drop often means 90% not that important stories, or not even a story, but the 10% is the important uh, things. And in every case, even for the non-important stuff, it is important to protect those sources, But because even if it's not a story for you, it could bring this person into trouble. Um, so that's important. The other thing is, I think we have to um, drag the issue of dealing with whistleblowers out of the investigative journalism corner, because this is something every journalist um, needs to know and needs to practice. I think using Signal or using PGP is not something where you can point your fingers, oh, that's the investigative guys, they should know and they have to know, but me working in another field in sports uh, or, or the business section, I don't have to do it because it's super complicated. Um, but yes, you have to do it. Every journalist has to be able, in my opinion, to use Signal to use PGP encryption, and I know that PGP is, at first glance, sometimes it seems to be difficult, and it, seem, it needs to be trained, but you have to do so, because, um, and I've seen it in yeah, media outlets where I worked, um, if you have a whistleblower who is writing your first email in an open email, like, how can I communicate with you in, on a, in a secure way, that that's already the first mistake, as you mentioned before. Um, you're burnt. I think you have to put out all your contact details. Um, you have to put out your PGP keys, your cell phone number, um, because the cell phone number is linked uh, to your Signal uh, account. You have to put out a Threema um, ID, in my opinion. And I think every journalist should put out as much contact details for secure communication as possible, knowing that it is a pain. Because putting out those details means you get hundreds of emails, hundreds of signal messages, hundreds of Threema uh, ideas, uh, Threema messages of, in regards to topics that are not that interested, sometimes they only want to pester you. It is not about a, a topic and our information. But I think it's important. And I also, putting that in brackets, I know that especially for um, female journalists, putting out their cell phone number 
is a huge thing. Exactly, especially uh, in a context of yeah. you know, prolific and often state-sanctioned online harassment, yeah. which is another complexity. But there's yeah. ways around. You can set up one or use one cell phone only for a signal communication that is for work and another one for all your private stuff that you have at home 24-7. So I think there's ways around it. But in the end, I think there's also one thing we have to keep in mind, and that speaks between the lines of many of those uh, principles. It's about ego. Um, because being responsible or acting responsible in regards to a whistleblower sometimes means, in my opinion, losing a story. Because there are stories where you basically have to tell your source, we can't run this story. The risk for you is too high. There's not enough people knowing about the information that you're currently providing to me. Um, then also it's about the ego of a whistleblower. Whistleblowers that are out there have seen what happened to Edward Snowden, and meaning have, having seen what happened to Edward Snowden, they have not that much seen the part that he is trapped in Moscow, but they've seen him being famous. And that's sometimes not a very good guiding principle because I still think that the best protection for whistleblowers is staying anonymous, knowing that it might be difficult um, to live with your secret. Um, I personally still do not know who John Doe is, the source of the Panama Papers, but imagining to be the one person who leaked this to my colleague Bastian uh, and me, it must have been a very tough time when you see that the data that you leaked to journalists led to news uh, all around the world, making headlines all around the world, and you not being able to tell your neighbor like, hey, that was me. Um, <laughs> and I think that's a very human, yeah. that's a question of human nature, but I think that's something you have to speak about, and that's something my colleague Bastian and me um, communicated about with John Doe before publishing it, because there might be that temptation to step out on day one, seeing all those headlines like, hey, here I am, that's me, putting a face to their revelation. But I think that would be a better advice. And I'm very glad that John Doe didn't take that road. <laughs> um, and I hope it does stay that, well, uh, that way. Thank you for that nuanced response. And, and the idea of humanity and ego are really important. And, I, yeah. and we could come back to talking about that because it's not all about the digital. It fundamentally, and we say this, it's, it's, it's a human relationship underscoring this. Julia, can I come, come to you next? I don't sure. know if you've had time to review these principles in any detail, um, but what, what do you um, think about that list of principles in their guidelines? Um, well, it's great. I'm really glad to see um, a bunch of these principles um, here. I have been, as a reporter who writes about technology, for 10 years I've been encouraging the news organizations that I worked with to step up their digital practices, to get um, secure job, to use encryption with various degrees of success. And, um, and now I've actually set up my own news organization, The Markup, we're gonna start publishing later this year. And it's so amazing to be able to do everything from the ground up. So we have started only with encrypted messaging from the beginning inside the newsroom, not even just with sources, but like we only use encryption. So yeah. we, we can build it from the start. We've already, ha we haven't started publishing. We haven't even hired all our journalists, but we've already had our first digital security training. That's amazing. So this is like, so you're doing startup with, with secure communication as, as you kind yes, of base Yes, absolutely. Like we're yeah. building it as part of our, our promise to readers and to sources that, um, because we really see ourselves as the thing that the reason you would want to read the markup is because we are tech experts. And so one of those things is we know how to communicate securely with you if you want to bring us some news. Um, and also because we're experts, hopefully our news will be smarter and better <laughs> to read. Um, and so, and yet I would say like no matter, even though we're doing all of the things, it's kind of an unwinnable situation, right? Like the reality winner story is yeah. one that makes you feel, makes me feel sick inside because um, I don't know if all of you know the story, but she provided some documents to the Intercept and they um, showed those documents to the government 
for comment, which is normal, right? You would normally say, I need some comment on these documents. And they were able to find some printer code. Micro dots, yeah. Yeah, some yeah. dots on the, in the <laughs> metadata of the page that um, w identified her. And through the printer, wasn't it? Through the printer, through the printer. exactly. Yeah. So there, and these are the kinds of threats that journalists have to have the imagination to think of, right? And like research. And I, I, I think of myself as a tech expert. I didn't know about these dots, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and we should say that the intercept was um, not as uniquely established in, in the way that your mission is, but it was certainly established oh, yeah. with a view to, you know, with Greenwald and, and Co., yep. with a view to, in a post-Snowden era, defending investigative reporting through this kind of expertise. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And actually, they had huge digital security expertise and much more money than we did. So they, <laughs> they actually had a great infrastructure for it. And it just, and so that's why I feel like there is this sort of fatality I have about it, um, yeah. which is we should do all the best that we can, and yet, um, at ProPublica, where I worked most recently, we had a thing on our page that said how to leak to us, and it said, you know, you can use SecureDrop, you can use encryption, and then it basically said, but you know what, maybe you should just send it in the mail. Like, that is actually kind of a really great <laughs> method, because um, it's still, analog is still kind of safer in many cases. Not always, but it can be. Um, I want to say one thing, though, just provocatively, that's missing from here, yeah, and I think we it? all know what that is, but the issue of legal liability, right, yeah. is a question that um, that everybody faces. In it, is, it is in the long-form version. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I'm sorry, I wasn't here last year for the formation oh, no, of, of it. Course. Um, but basically, just... One thing that's always bothered me is the fact that you kind of can, you know, talk to a source and you say, I'll do what I can for you. But when it really, when the rubber hits the road mm. and reality winner gets sued, you know, yeah. your news organization actually doesn't have any responsibility to defend her. Now, I would like to say the Intercept has gone above yes. and beyond yeah. in actually paying for some of her legal defense. I don't exactly know how much, but quite a bit. It's a substantial amount. And in fact, um, the Gupta Leaks scandal in South Africa it was a whistleblower-driven story as well. And that organization, Daily Maverick, in, in uh, collaboration with Ama Bungane, they, they did something very similar. Uh, yeah. So it's very rare, however. It's extremely yeah. rare, right? And that's one of the things that I feel like um, there's no way right now with journalism, economics being so terrible that anyone could truly recommend that journalists take on this liability, and yet at the same time, it feels like this unspoken thing, which is, you know, the, all of the legal risk is really on them, and, and the source is the one who always goes to jail. The journalists sometimes get threatened with jail, and in some, but it's much more rare for a journalist to be sent to prison, and so it's just one of those things where um, that's why I appreciate your, you have a thing in here about cautioning the source on risks, because it's, it, it feels like one of those things like a doctor should have, like the, you, you have to say to them, like, you're, you know, you have six months to live, you know, something so like, like that. Commi commitment to this ethical tenant, but with the disclaimer that we cannot guarantee. Yeah, <laughs> sort of. exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Julia. I might come to you, um, Jared, and in your role um, at ICIJ, which is this almost like a clearinghouse for the organization of global collaborative investigative journalism projects, what, do you need to take from whether it's an exercise like this or everything that's been learned um, in a, in a post-Snowden environment in particular about working differently with uh, confidential sources and whistleblowers, particularly on projects at scale across borders with large numbers of journalists? Yeah, look, I think we need to get, I mean, I think fundamentally we need to question what a whistleblower is. I mean, everyone thinks of whistleblowers these days now as, as Snowden and, and John Doe, but all journalism relies on whistleblowing, and I think we need to go back to that. You know, we, we seem to think that it has to be big data sets or big things, but every political journalist relies on a certain number of sources, and every one of those sources is actually a whistleblower, but they're not called whistleblowers, and so therefore there isn't that sort of fundamental need to, to sort of, you know, um, I guess, protect every source. I think that, you know, we're, we're also in a period of... Um, of great times for journalists because technology is allowing, journal, allowing whistleblowers and, and people's sources, and I'm going to use the word whistleblower because I think it should go beyond that, to sort of gather information in a, on a scale that's never been thought of possible before. I mean, the Panama Papers is a good example of it. I think you, you talk about um, you know, going back to WikiLeaks that really sort of started all this, and it's just been growing and growing. And every time we see another big revelation like the Paradise Papers was actually a larger document set 
technically than, than, than Panama Papers, and I think we're only at the beginning of something. So I do think we need to have more debate around what a whistleblower is, because I think some people are trying to push it into a corner and, and a kind of attack it. I think, I, I guess I come from this because I work across many different nations, and I find in America in particular, there is a kind of a snobbery around what they call leaked journalism, and I think we need to get away from that. I think when we started um, working in this area at ICIJ, our first big project was in 2013, and I got an awful lot of pushback from the American end of things, American media partners. And they didn't who, want to work with you initially, did they? Some of they, they, they basically did, yeah, they didn't, see, they didn't see this as real journalism because they, they thought that the moment you get a big set of documents, that that is the story. And I think everyone who has worked on these kind of projects realize that when you get the information, it is the beginning of a very long journey, not the end of one. And I think, you know, I was very happy that, you know, in the end, the Panama Papers was actually, you know, recognized in the U.S. As, as real journalism. But that was a real battle, and I think we need to, again, have that debate as well. Mm -hmm. So we kind of went through a process of trying to differentiate, actually, between whistleblowers and confidential sources. And one of the reasons for doing that is because there are legal protections for whistleblowers as distinct from confidential sources, and the bar is high for whistleblowing. So there's a kind of... These definitional, definitional debates are really important and they're hard. Um, and there is, you know, there, there is a debate worth having about whether, a, I would say, a, a political um, apparatchik who's trying to, um, you know, achieve a certain outcome within a political context uh, for their own gain, potentially, with a mix of disinformation and misinformation and accurate information is a little bit different to somebody who has, um, uh, with, with um, you know, almost pure of heart intent provided, um, come across something that they, they believe is, um, you know, um, extremely suspicious or ex extremely dangerous or um, corrupt and wanting to see that revealed. Yeah, What's look, your response to yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, it's very heartening. I mean, we, we're journalists, so we're always going after the bad guys, but it is actually nice to know that there are good people out there, mm. and I think they're the people that need to be protected. I, but I do think that this is great to have this happening, it's great to have communication around this, not just for journalists, but also I think we also have to help <laughs> to communicate to to whistleblowers or sources, sort of better ways of, of communicating with us. And I think, you know, some of the panelists have referred to this because often I found, I've been doing this like for 35 years, the mistakes that are made are usually made before they come to you. And, and it's kind of too late for journalists afterwards to try and retroactively change things. So we've also got an obligation, I think, to, you know, to do better in terms of educating the public about how to talk to us better. Yeah, indeed. Educate the public and also get the public interested in these issues um, and take responsibility for their own defence, perhaps, to a degree as well. Sulet, what's... Um, i got something burning. Here's a, here's <laughs> really a, here's a news talk. story for those of you out there who care about whistleblowers and freedom of speech. Uh, on around April 16 or 17 in Strasbourg, um, the European Parliament is, we think going to pass the EU Directive on Whistleblower Protection. Now, this is something that I have been involved with, um, along with the team from Blueprint for Free Speech and a whole set of civil society group, academics, researchers, journalists, for about five years we've been working on this, and this is the grand moment. Um, the, the hardest battle has actually been in the last month uh, when there was a, a really tough bit of obstinacy by certain per permanent representatives uh, who did not um, want to allow whistleblowers, who wanted them to be required to have mandatory internal whistleblowing. So there's three tiers of whistleblowing, first tier internal, second tier to a regulatory agency, third tier externally, for example, to the media, also to an MP, there are other external sources. And, uh, and, and it's been hard won but there is now third tier whistleblowing protected under that draft directed. And that's a super big win for journalism. There are potentially some restrictives and we are gonna see um, the next battlefront be in 27 or 28 countries, we don't know. Um, the national transposition into national laws of that directive. But the idea that this directive is actually binding is mammoth. It will make Europe the forefront of whistleblower protection in the world. It is a very good directive. 
Um, and so for those of you who are interested in this space, definitely go out and, and report on it. Um, civil society generally has been very happy with the outcome of it. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is the Perugia principles have been translated into German, Spanish, and Greek. And today we launch online the electronic version, the Russian language translation of it. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is we've talked about risk of first contact. Um, there's a big difference between anonymity and confidentiality. Encryption can give confidentiality. It doesn't necessarily give anonymity. So the way that sources are burned, sensitive sources including whistleblowers, is often through loss of anonymity, not just loss of confidentiality. There are some tools out there to help with that. Briar is one. Um, uh, Blueprint has supported one called Ricochet. We have actually are looking for grant funding to update that if anyone out there is interested. Um, but Ricochet for the moment is a downloadable, free, open source, simple to use program that uses Tor to allow a journalist and a source to communicate just by typing online. We don't even have document transfer functionality yet one of the things on those grant, grant wishes, uh, but it does provide first contact protection, so. Great, and I mean, I, I think we need to bring the conversation back to um, the very human level uh, at, at the end, but this is, this is the territory where we're working in, and, and one of the things that I think everybody has alluded to already is where is the next threat coming from? What will it look like? And Julia particularly was kind of referencing this, and how do you prepare for that in advance? What are, what are the kind of you know um, geopolitical um, issues? And you know, uh, I mean, in Russia, for example, um, where the Russian edition is, is just is just hit the internet apparently, which is great. Um, but you have um, you know you have a state that's that's actively engaged in um, in, in in attempts to uh, intimidate and harass journalists and confidential sources in many ways um, now trying to restrict behaviors online in such a way that would inhibit uh, whistleblowers further so there's this you know the, the geopolitics are fascinating yeah. I, I think I mean you're talking about threats I think the biggest threat I think has got to happen is that the obligation we have for instance um, uh, when you get an anonymous leak or a large amount of information, you have an extra responsibility to make sure that that information is correct and that you're not being set exactly. up. And I think the biggest threat to us actually is that because we've now had a number of major successes with major leaked material, that someone is going to deliberately give us something that is going to end up wrong and is going to really damage absolutely. journalism. And I think that's our biggest threat. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's something I found too in research around disinformation, the way that journalists are being targeted. There is absolutely an attempt to misdirect and mislead. And um, the weaponization of big data sets is already a thing. <laughs> and, you know, and, and something to watch out for is a really important point. Can we go to questions in, um, in the audience? Does anyone want to ask anything? This is a panel of rare expertise either side of me here. <laughs> or have any comments. While you're pondering, um, I should say that this is it is free this stuff is freely available. There's a shorthand pocket version and a long form one that is full of linkage um, to tips and tools and laws and so on. Yes, sorry, what's your question? I wonder in your opinion. I think the microphone's not on, is it? Hello? Hello, oh, okay. That's better. Thank you. Uh, Leo journalist. Um, member of CIG. <laughs> uh, I wonder whether, in your opinion, it's possible that the whistleblowers must be paid for their work. In, a, in, other, in other words, you know that Germany and Denmark paid uh, the Panama Papers fight. So, in your opinion, is, is it correct to, say, to, to find that uh, the whistleblowers must be paid for their work? I'm happy to take that. Paid by whom? Yeah. By the state, <laughs> in this case. <laughs> Germany and Denmark, they, they paid a lot of money. The U.S. has a system. But Jared, do you yeah, I think in the U.S. there's certainly, and I think Canada are trying to introduce what they call key TAM laws, which are basically laws that allow successful whistleblowers to get a percentage of the money. I think that's a, it's a, you know, I, I think the debate is over on that. I mean, it is law now in some countries. Um, the question is, should it be extended to you know, the rest of the world. Uh, I, again, a good question. I mean, I think it's very important to make a point about journalists. I think it's very important that journalists don't financially benefit from big leaks because I think that's crossing an ethical line and I think it's very dangerous if we do. I mean, there's a lot of, we, we, we've just published a story in the last, I think, 24 hours ago about the Panama Papers alone, I think, recovered at $1.2 billion from uh, people around the world that were basically caught as a result of the information. I think, 
You know, we've had a few emails from readers saying, hey, why aren't you getting a percentage of that? Why isn't Suddeutsche getting a percentage of that? And I think, that's, I think that is an ethical line and an ethical debate we have to have. I, I think it would be wrong. I, uh, but again, it's, you know. But if I, if yeah, I how might, do you monetize yeah. whistleblowers? Yeah. Um, may chime in here. I personally think that as a journalist, we should also not pay our uh, sources. Yes. Um, I think that's very important because that may give a very, the wrong incentive. But saying that, at the same time, I think um, whistleblower need um, money in the end, for example, for lawyers. So I think we have to find a, a compromise, and I think there's a very easy compromise because there's a lot of um, law firms out there that are working on a pro bono basis that are, if you ask them as a journalist, providing you with a secure communication line where you could basically then recommend a source like here's a list of five law firms that already agreed um, to work pro bono um, and could help you. Knowing that maybe one of those law firms may recommend this source to basically cut all the contact with a journalist, but if that's the best for the, for the, uh, for the uh, whistleblower, then I think we have to accept it. But I think that's the way where you can find um, the middle ground because if I ask my editor to provide, for example, a fund, um, a legal fund for whistleblowers, I think I have really good arguments, but in the end, um, he will not go as far as I would no. like, <laughs> like him to go. But um, yeah, I agree, fully agree that we have to um, help whistleblowers with legal advice and professional legal advice because I cannot provide legal advice that is uh, as good as it mm. is by major professional law firms. There's a question here. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there was also one there. Yeah. I didn't see. Sure, shall we st yep, there and then here. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Xenia, I'm from Russia, so I think my question partly comes out of interest and particular um, cultural background, let's say so. Um, what I've got from this whole panel now is it's not really like encouraging for whistleblowers, but it's protecting for whistleblowers. Uh, but again, coming from my cultural experience and historical experience, how do we as journalists can keep um, a particular line and help the whistleblowers to keep the particular line and not go, you know, full Soviet Union style when everyone was a whistleblower for his neighbor or whatever else? Because now it seems like in some point, it can be safe and maybe even right to, yes. you know, blow a whistle on yep. someone. How do we keep this line and not go, you know, very backwards in this? It's a really, really good point and a really important point. And um, I think a lot of the time, I mean, we are all Western journalists and academics. Um, I've spent as much time as I can engaging with people in um, different cultural and historical contexts, but. Um, even in, say, in South Africa, where I've recently been doing research, this is, this is an issue where you've got whistleblower protection debates and an extraordinary journalism being done based on the back of whistleblowers, and then the disinformation tactics that leverage the apartheid era principles of effectively calling people spies. And so the line between whistleblower and spy is blurred, which is kind of what you're talking about. It's a really interesting question. I don't know if anybody has. I just would like to jump in a little bit. Um, I think. Um there, I think you're right. There's like a there's a thing that I think is not helpful in journalism, which is this idea that everything that's secret is then news, and it's not right. And so I think it's important for journalists to recognize that just because somebody tells you something that's embarrassing about some person or whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be your top priority. And I think particularly in the world we're living in right now with a lot of strategic leaking, right? So like the, the, the email, the Hillary Clinton emails was like a strategic leak to distract during the election. Yeah. And um, that kind of thing, I think we as journalists need to be increasingly aware and on guard against. That's one reason in my organization, uh, we're obviously going to take leaks, but we have a goal of collecting our own data and making our own decisions about what to cover based on what's important to the world, not just based on what comes over the transom. Mm -hmm. Julia, can I stick with... Oh, sorry, uh, Philip, you had a, a question as well. Take your question, then I want to ask one more question of the panel. 
uh, in journalism. And I wanted to ask you, what's your view on hackers becoming whistleblowers? When someone comes to, to you as a journalist by claiming, I'm an hacker, I just hack into this surveillance company, for instance, and here is the evidence of them selling uh, Trojan spywares to Saudi Arabia or whatever, and, and it's different than classic whistleblowing, but it's becoming more and more common for newsrooms. And I'm wondering what should journalists do in order to work uh, in the best possible way with these individuals while at the same time doing ethical work? Mm. Thanks. The question was about academics? Hackers. No, working with hackers. Hacker. Yeah. Hackers. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. The soft Italian age. Um, hackers. Well... I mean, my feeling is hackers are just like any other source, right? Like, you know, they've um, many sources obtain their information illegally, <laughs> so they're not unique in that situation. And so, I think you have to always remember what is the most the most important thing is not is whether you can verify the information and whether it really is in the public interest, right? Much hacked material is not in the public interest, and it's just personally embarrassing. Um, but I have no problem with hackers, and in my newsroom is um, half hackers. So we are 50% um, you know, programmer, developer, slash hackers, <laughs> and 50% sort of traditional human source journalists. Which is a great mix of yeah. <laughs> skills. Yeah. Sula, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with you in that, um, I mean, there is sometimes some traditional media have kind of turned their nose up at that sort of data. Um, I don't think that that's the job of the media. The job of the media is to serve the public by giving news. And while you may not want to be going out and commissioning crimes <laughs> by asking people to hack for you, um, I do think that uh, you take the material and, and, and you publish it if it's worthwhile and it's newsworthy. Um, on the question from the uh, lady from Russia, I think the thing that makes the difference between, if you will, an old Soviet um, environment and current uh, is actually that third tier whistleblowing. It's the media that makes the difference. So if you only have internal whistleblowing, you strengthen the power of the central entity, the central corporation, the central state. If you allow competitive channels, third channels going over to the media, you weaken that and you make the accountability much better. So that's the intrinsic difference. On key TAM, I think it's culturally relevant. Um, in the UK, there's been a general push against it because a lot of the whistleblowing has been around the health sector and the hospital sector. People don't feel that's an appropriate place to give financial reward. But in the financial sector, um, in Ukraine, where we've done work with civil society groups, there's a really strong desire for it because it's culturally appropriate. I don't know if you wanted to say something on that, Frederick, but I want to pull you back to another issue, if you don't. So I remember you telling me a story about um, how when you were working with um, John Doe, um, it, you had issues that you were dealing with around um, digital disruption in your own life in that because you had to be permanently switched on um, yeah. and in constant communication. It really took over your life. I mean, the kind of journalism we do now is not just human-based and big database, it's also permanently connected, isn't it? So, Well, I think if you would ask the wives of my colleague Bastian over my, <laughs> and my wife, um, they would tell you the story about how difficult it was at certain times uh, before we published the Panama Papers because we had more communication with uh, John Doe um, than with basically <laughs> them because it was like 24-7 uh, uh, communication, you never know when there would be the next communication. And it was not always like being about the information uh, being contained in the Panama Papers, but it was sometimes uh, the feeling that you had to calm down somebody at the other uh, end that, or that the other <coughs> end had to calm us down. So it was a really like a very personal uh, relationship in the end. Um, so we got to know the humor of this person um, I Even think though you still don't know his identity, no, it's no, extraordinary, but isn't it? I would guess that I could, s there were certain uh, parts of the h humor of this person that I would uh, be able uh, to get an idea from if it's the person would sit in front of me. Um, but I think that's important because we do not, or we should not as journalists treat this person only like an information provider. Mm -hmm. It is a human being, a human being with a lot of fears. Uh, and we have to take this fears uh, seriously um, because we have seen how the life of whistleblowers has changed in the past. Mm. 
by do, uh, blowing the whistle. We have seen um, uh, Antoine Deltour or Raphael Halle, the sources um, of the Luxembourg leaks, facing uh, criminal charges for mm. several years. We have seen Edward Snowden being trapped in Moscow. We have seen Chelsea Manning ending up in jail. Um, so, and there's, or if we look at Julia Stepanova to, to change the, the subject, in, uh, and she blew the whistle on uh, doping in sports. And now she's basically living in hiding somewhere in the United States. And it's not a transactional relationship, no. is it? It's a, well, it yeah. But it's, it's really hard because um, you, this is the money, uh, the, the, the time you put in this relationship is not something that goes directly into your reporting. Mm. But still, it's an essential part of the relationship between you and a source or a whistleblower. And I think that's the biggest part or the biggest mistake I, for example, made in the past before Panama Papers, that I s did not treat that part of the relationship as important as it is. Mm -hmm. Because it was, I ignored sometimes messages uh, of a source um, because I was in a hectic phase of my life or I had to, to, was working mm -hmm. on a deadline. But you have to. Um, and that, I think, your source, a whistleblower, feels if there's a journalist at the other end who's taking fear seriously, worries, um, and who basically takes time and yeah. thereby appreciates the risk the person at the other end uh, takes. Absolutely. I was going to ask you um, all to finish by telling us about the most important lesson you learned or the worst mistake you made. <laughs> you've just you've just told us. Um, so I'm going to go to, to Jared. Can you respond to that? And if there's anything else you want to address as well? I, I, I think that Frederick has already made the point I wanted to make, that they are, it's a human-to-human -human interaction here. They are human beings, and sometimes we forget that, because I, I've heard it said on a, on a panel before that, that um, your sources are not your friends, and I actually totally disagree with that. I think your sources have to become your friends, and you have to be their friends forever. That's the relationship that you're entering into here. And I, I, and I know that some people will say that's wrong, and I'm happy to, to listen to that argument, but I do think you've got to be a human being at all times. That was James Ryson's actual position during the discussion last year that led to this, that we have to get back to an, um, a fundamental human understanding of this relationship being far more than transactional. He described them as his friends as well. I'm sure you've had that discussion. Big mistake or biggest learning? Oh, <laughs> biggest, I, I, don't, I don't really have, I, I, don't, I can't think of one at the moment. That's all but, right. Yeah. I'm going to prompt you with one. One thing that you said to me once, which I've um, referenced again and again and it has made a lot of sense to journalists, is... Yes, in this digital context, the risks are bigger. So are the opportunities for amazing journalism. And one thing you said was about stretching the timeline and how beneficial that can be in terms of potentially protecting people. So stretching the timeline from receipt of information to publication. Yeah, I guess that is one lesson that I have learned over the years. For instance, um, you know, with the original Offshulix um, stories that kicked a lot of this off back in 2013, I'd got the material from a, a whistleblower who... You know, again, I'm very proud of the fact that these people are still anonymous. But um, yeah, there was a period when the mistake was made. They contacted me in a way that they could easily have been traced. Um, but by delaying publication of that story by more than a year and not sharing with anybody else for at least six months, you're actually able to erase some of the traces, uh, the electronic traces that could have, um, you know, caught the source. Um, it wasn't perfect. I think we often got this sort of um, reliance on technology. We think technology is going to be the solution to everything. It isn't. Uh, and I think sometimes, uh, you know, just using common sense is, is a very logical approach. Yeah, great. Thanks. Julia? Um, I guess when it comes to mistakes, one of the things that I feel like is really difficult with the first contact issue that you're talking about is that um, I often will meet people just sort of an, like a source will start as a very casual meeting at a party or an event. And I've tried many times to say to people like, hey, we just met, <laughs> why don't we just only talk encrypted? <laughs> and it feels like you're asking for sex on the first date. <laughs> it's like, it's just too much, right? People are like, oh my God, whoa. What are you out <laughs> your phone for? <laughs> right? And so I wish that we could normalize encrypted communication so that it was just totally normal for everyone to always communicate that way so that 
because I spend an enormous amount of time trying to convince people who I don't even know whether they will become fruitful sources, but I want to avoid the first contact problem. And I just, so, um, so I'm hoping that, I think it's actually becoming more common with WhatsApp. And so I feel like there's some hope, um, although WhatsApp is terrible because they share all your contacts <laughs> with Facebook, right? So, um, but at any rate, at least it's an encrypted platform that's becoming common. Um, so was that the question? Mistakes? Yeah, no, it's yeah. really, yeah, no, it's a really important. Um, uh, Reality, and for me, um, I'm going to let you have the last words, Sule, because I want to riff off what um, what Julia just said. For me, one of my um, learnings, and I finished my PhD last year on these intersected issues, and one of the big takeaways, which I didn't call a takeaway in my dissertation, but is this need to communicate um, in a way that people understand in terms of real life experiences, like in Adha in India, which was a massive um, privacy invading. Um, uh, system that the government was introducing, which was exposing people to all manner of um, identity fraud and um, exposure risks and connected to every aspect of their life, to humanise and personalise that. As a, a, One of our jobs as journalists, I think, is to translate this stuff into ways that the broader community can understand and react to so that they are better protected when and if they need to reach a journalist. So I think we need more activist and advocacy journalism on doing this kind of work. Um, that's my learning. Sulet, would you like to wrap it up for us? And then I, I, I haven't, agree. sorry, just before you do, I haven't mentioned this yet, but as a reward for the people who have stayed, <laughs> we are having um, cocktails at Hotel Rosetta in the courtyard across the road um, to celebrate the launch of this, uh, uh, I wasn't saying, we could say tome, this very um, useful handbook. <laughs> Um, so please, please hang around and, um, and think about joining us over there for a drink and um, to continue the conversation. Are, are those you, free? You have, you have are to those free cocktails, signal, yeah. Julie? Are free cocktails free? for a room full of journalists. Now, when I say cocktails, <laughs> I can't vouch for the kind of cocktails, and uh, I don't know how much they'll be. You might have to fight for the wine, but it will be there. <laughs> free, free alcohol. Yes, alcohol. thank you, Sula. So please bring it home for us. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to close two things. Um, the first is, how many of you have ever encouraged or urged a source to move to Signal or an encrypted platform or some improved security environment? Just hands up, show of hands. How many of you have done it? Just even once. Right, so you are great and it shows you can actually do the steps. You've already taken the first steps here um, in the Purge Principles and I think I'd really encourage you to consider the next steps in the process. But the second thing I'd just add is, um, I agree, we need more activism journalism. Um, and in closing, I would say we need to not only defend whistleblowers and confidential sources, but those journalists who are and have been involved in activist journalism, and that includes Julian Assange. I know he's a point of contention among many journalists uh, and is perceived by many to be prickly, but he's also someone who is potentially facing many years in prison and extradition for his activism journalism. So uh, a little bit of thought on that would be a good thing. Please take a copy of uh, these handbooks, um, the small ones, the big ones, they're yours. Please take them with you. Um, and very many thanks to the International Journalism Festival, which um, has created for, um, I think, where are we, Chris Potter, I don't know if you're in the room, many years, decade or, um, or more, I think we're at now, of opportunities for people to collaborate. And I think this is, this is hopefully the first of many projects that goes beyond meetings and conversations and um, outputs of journalism that, that goes to a kind of community collaboration around an issue of our times that's fundamental to our ability to do our work. So thank you to, um, to Chris Potter and the festival for bringing us together and having a reason to come together. Thanks, everybody. See you across the road. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. And see you at the free booze and cocktails. <laughs> You're <a> shocker. <laughs> 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 I know it's important. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's just a.